compliment of the mayor on it. Good morning and welcome to the 2023 Farmington State of the City Address. I'm John Altoff, I'm the interim president of the Dakota County Regional Chamber of Commerce. The Dakota County Regional Chamber of Commerce serves as a local chamber of commerce for nine cities within Dakota County and three townships and, and cities including Farmington. Farmington represents some of the fastest growth in the entire region and for that we're grateful to be here. Today is a great example of the partnership that happens uh, that we have with the city and will continue to grow in 2023 and beyond. So thank you all of you who've been able to take time to attend today's program either here or online. And for those of you who aren't on, are online and can't see, it is a full house in, in the council chambers today. So we're gonna learn about the great work of the city over the last year and what's in store for this year. Uh, no event happens without sponsors, so I want to take a moment to uh, thank our sponsors, Evolution Accounting and Consulting, Minnesota Energy Resources, Minwest Bank, Premier Banks, and Castle Rock Bank. Please let's recognize our sponsors for their generous support. It's now my honor to introduce your mayor, Joshua Hoyt. Mayor Hoyt is serving in his first term as mayor and was previously a city council member. He's a Marine Corps veteran, suicide awareness activist, a husband and a father of two. And we were just talking a little bit before we started here today. Uh, five years ago, he was a write-in candidate for the city council and today he stands as your mayor. It says a lot about him and about the city of Farmington. So he has promised me that this is gonna be a different presentation than we normally get from other cities in the Dakota County region, and so I look forward to that. So please welcome Farmington's mayor, the, the mayor with the best beard in Dakota County, <laughs> Joshua Hill. Good morning. Good morning. I love the full house. Absolutely love it. Uh, again, my name is Joshua Hoyt, mayor for the city of Farmington, and it is my honor to present you this year's Farmington State of the City for 2023. Uh, as previously stated, this will be live streamed on the city of Farmington's Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and it's also available on uh, the government channel, Charter Spectrum 180. Our State of the City presentation is a look back over the previous year, and it's a celebration of our progress. Additionally, we'll provide some insight on the work that is planned for this year. As was previously stated, we have a, a handful of great sponsors, uh, and we all know that this presentation would not be possible without their support. So again, let's do a quick round of applause for all five of our sponsors. <laughs> and thank you to the Dakota County Regional Chamber of Commerce, for your continued support and for your dedication to all of the businesses across Dakota County. The Farmington City Council. Uh, I did not see Steve here, but uh, council members, Steve is here, council member Steve Wilson. <laughs> he snuck in at the last minute. I've been here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> You're hidden over there, Steve. Uh, council member Nick Lean. Council Member Holly Bernatz and Council Member Katie Porter. Uh, we also have Met Council Member Wendy Wolf, uh, our Dakota County Commissioner Mike Slavic, uh, School District Superintendent Jason Berg, and Kyle Christensen, our School Board Chair, in back. Can we just give them a round of applause? Each of them continues to make significant contributions to our residents and our community, and we appreciate each of them for their, their efforts. We're gonna welcome some new leadership this year. This past year, we hired three new directors to our senior leadership team. Julie Flatten, our Assistant City Administrator and Human Resources Director, Deanna Kinnon, our Community Development Director, 
and John Powell, our public works director and city engineer. All three are highly skilled, ambitious, and collaborative leaders. With their addition to the team, we are undoubtedly stronger as an organization. Each of them hit the ground running and have already made significant impacts to our standards of service, our strategic planning, and our overall operational effectiveness. Our city council priorities, quality business growth and retention, community engagement, infrastructure support. Now these three were adopted as priorities in 2021 as the pillars of our work and our vision. But this year we added a fourth and arguably our most important pillar, and that's employee engagement, culture, and wellness. We know that without our employees and our team, we cannot achieve our goals. Within quality business growth and retention, the three primary areas of focus were to enhance business activities, to positively position Farmington to welcome, support, and attract development to help diversify our tax base. And again, to maintain and grow our existing relationships. So what did we do? We started by reviewing our development process. Our team solicited feedback from builders, developers, and businesses, and then we listened. Our development review committee reviewed the feedback. We've implemented sweeping changes across all departments to ensure that we are being more efficient and as effective as we can. As previously stated, we hired new director Deanna Kinnan. We also hired planning coordinator Jared Johnson and economic development coordinator Stephanie Amon. We updated our business subsidy policy. We revised our redevelopment initiative plan, and we also created a new TIF district. Aerospace engineering is, our, is in our industrial park. They have recently started construction on a 13,333 square foot addition to expand the existing building for increased production and new processing systems. This expansion will enable the company to continue to expand its diverse product offering in aerospace and cryogenic insulation applications and beyond. We also welcome three new businesses to the community this year. Evolution Accounting and Consulting acquired the formerly known as Ackerman and Berquist Accounting. The Great Oaks Academy, the Academy moved from a former location at, at Bethel's Rock Church into the Riverside West District and JT Outdoors. JT Outdoors expanded from a home-based business and moved into the formerly known as Snap Fitness location on Pilot Knob. Later this summer, construction will begin on a new commercial project at 310 Third Street. To most of you, that's known as the old Dakota Motors building. This is a four-story, 74-unit, apartment complex that will consist of one and two bedroom units with ground level garage parking. Planning for this complex commercial project was an open process. We held multiple open houses, public hearings, and we sought resident and business input. This is an opportunity to diversify our housing market, place more residents in close proximity to our downtown business, and most importantly, it was a goal of our downtown redevelopment plan and 2040 comprehensive plan. What does residential development have to do with business growth and retention, you might ask? Well, it goes right to population and diversity of housing options. When we met with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, we learned how important having diverse housing options was to prospective developers, investors, and businesses. So we're gonna go through real quickly. Whoops, bear with me here. It wouldn't be in a presentation without some technical difficulties. Well, we won't, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, most notably, there were two development, I'm gonna say three developments. Uh, the first one's Vita Tiva. So Vita Tiva is a 55 and up aging in place community, uh, slab on grade. Uh, this development is on the south side of Highway 50 to the west of the Vermilion River Crossing. 
uh, the Vita Tiva development shows that you can have development in an otherwise agricultural area. So much of our growth had happened to the north of town. We've had some stuff on the northeast side of town, but it, it was the first project that really showed that there was a, a that development could transition and shift to the, towards the west. So albeit a residential development, it also is placing more rooftops in a centralized location to our community. We believe in fact, when you look at traffic patterns and uh, how people traverse through the community that just simply by having the placement of this development in this location um, adjacent to the industrial park, it's going to continue to spurn more activity in adjacent parcels. Thank you, sir. So some of this is just recap from last year. Um, again, we hadn't had a whole lot of residential development uh, really since um, we'll say 2008 2010 was the tail end of it. And so over the last few years, we've been showing the progress of these developments as they're, they're going through whispering fields out on Flagstaff, uh, just to the south of our high school. That development is well underway. Again, additional rooftops bring in more employees. Prospective businesses and investors are looking at the readiness of the employment base in your community. Sapphire Lake, this is out on the east side of town. Uh, Sapphire Lake had 131 homes. They are in their final phase of construction. Again, continuing to support the rooftop approach. This is the Vita Tiva development. So again, you see what would be Highway 50 to the right side of your screen. Full amenities buildings, multi-unit complexes, and Vita Tiva will also have 100, it's platted for 141 single family homes. This development will continue to push to the south towards the Vermilion River, eventually going to the south of Vermilion River. Now more importantly is Vermilion Commons. Vermilion Commons is on the west side of Denmark across from Bachman. This is the first townhome development that's been approved in this community in over 15 years. Again, bringing homes at a price point that is not currently available within our, our community helps draw in a different financial segment. It draws in a different um, classification of worker, a point of emphasis that we've heard from prospective businesses, developers, and investors. We're also partnering with uh, Dakota County's Community Development Agency, and later this year, construction will start uh, south of St. Michael's Church on Denmark on one to four bedroom unit market rate, um, I'll call them condos or units, townhouses. Uh, we've had several CDA properties uh, in and around the community. We've had a few in the city of Farmington. Again, this is another way that we can continue to show that by diversifying our housing market, we will continue to bring additional rooftops and different uh, additional populace to our community to help support prospective businesses. Now, I can tell you all day long why I believe that Farmington is a great community. But we went out and we asked a few of our business owners exactly what they thought and why they chose Farmington. 12 years ago, I moved my agency to Farmington for a growth opportunity and stayed for the rich history, family owned shops, restaurants, the sense of community, and knowing every business owner by their first name. Farmington is not just a place to work, it's my second home. It's the place where trust and relationships are built over ice cream or handshakes. And that's why I'm still in Farmington. I remember when we heard about the opportunity to open a restaurant in Farmington, we were so excited. It's such a beautiful community. Everyone was so excited to have us and we knew we could create something that wasn't offered in Farmington. Uh, we've actually expanded twice now. That's when we created Farmtown Brew Hall. So people come and have a beer and a burger and, and throw axes back there. And, and then, yeah, it also allows us to have some private party space back there. We just recently found out that a space next to us is becoming available and, and we're deciding that, you know, we love this community and love being here so much that we're gonna actually expand our business uh, one more space over. But we're excited to, to be able to expand our business here in Farmington. And that's our why. Working with the city of Farmington has been a great experience. Farmington has been a great partner in many of our initiatives for both residential and commercial properties. I've always found the staff to be responsive, innovative, and very friendly. 
When you think about building and establishing business relationships, working with Farmington has been a very rewarding experience. And that's our why. Now, speaking of business retention and maintaining relationships, in 1977, Farmington resident Jeff Thielen started Thielen Cabinet Company. The business was located at 308 Elm Street, which you may know today as the Blackfire Creative Building. Until the building was sold to the city of Farmington for public works in April of 1991. It was 32 years ago this month that Jeff Thielen and his wife Sandy opened the doors to their new shop on Eaton Avenue in the Farmington Industrial Park. They were the first business within the industrial park and the first business within a newly established TIF district. Thielen employed as many as 20 people and supplied numerous local builders with cabinets for Farmington built homes. Jeff retired in 2016 and his son Chad continues to carry the legacy. Please join me in congratulating Jeff, Sandy and Chad on 32 years in the industrial park and 45 years in business and they're with us here today. Jeff, don't curse my name. <laughs> community engagement. The three bullet points within community engagement were to increase transparency in city government, to communicate effectively, and to enhance outreach and create tools to encourage resident engagement. Positive involvement in community events, such as the Rotary, Farmington Business Networking Group, the Community Expo, Independent School District 192 events, Farmington Due Days, Patriotic Day, Toys for Town, Yellow Ribbon Network events, and many more. Our fire department increased public education and fire prevention awareness through social media and YouTube. They increased our public relations through public open houses, events like the Easter egg hunt, school visits, and so much more. Now this July, our fire department will have an amazing 150th anniversary event at the fairgrounds. And yes, they will have fireworks. <laughs> our liquor operations team has initiated several roundup campaigns to help support various events and groups within our community. They've raised over $14,000 for the, they've raised over $14,000 for the Rambling River Center and also the new van which is currently on order. They raised almost $16,000 for Toys for Town and for 360, 360 communities. Within Park and Recreation, we embarked on our Jim Bell Park and Preserve Master Planning process, which sought resident input, celebrated the 40th anniversary at our Rambling River Center. They secured $6,450 in sponsorship for mu music and movies in the park, and the use of social media and registration software there's a few pictures from one of the wine tasting events and also from the 40th anniversary event at the Rambling River Center. Our police department launched a community engagement team, their first event being Chill with a Cop. They continue to refine and expand their footprint year round through various events. Toys for Town this year served over 120 families and 400 children and raised over $41,000 with the help of our residents and the business owners of our community. Within Public Works, we continue soliciting resident and business input on projects through surveys, through open houses, and using pinpoint mapping tools. We're in the process of updating Farmington Fix and ironing out how a resident engages with the city because those touch points are most important. You know, for us as business operators, when someone comes to the cash register, when we turn a wrench, we have a touch point with our guest. But as a city, our touch points don't always involve us. It's when they're on the paths, they see something. Someone's not around, but that's the touch point with the community. Farmington Fix is a tool that in my opinion is dramatically underutilized. We have to continue to find ways to get resident involvement, provide feedback, get it to the appropriate department as ex expeditiously as possible to resolve the issue as quickly as we can. That constant level of communication, not only is it transparent, 
but it shows that we can deliver on the promise that we make to our residents. We look forward to more that Farmington Fix can do for our residents. We're also initiating and utilizing software and technology to enhance our communications. Here's a picture from our Chill with the Cop event and then our Farmington Fix logo. Within infrastructure support, two main bullet points here. Provide the highest level of core service. That's why we're here. City government exists to provide core services. We have to provide them at the highest level possible, higher than even that of which our residents expect. We also need to meet industry standards for CIP. Now, I'm not typically one to say that meeting a standard is okay, but if we're not meeting the standard, that's a problem. Our goal is to meet the standard, we will exceed the standard once we work on our efficiency and our ability to meet the standard. We started by hiring a new, develop, or a new public works and, and community development directors. Uh, one of the large initiatives was submitting for and receiving $750,000 in congressionally directed spending through the community project funding. This fell on our plate about the middle of May last year, and we had 10 days to turn around a plan for submission. This was one of those times when you went, I'm really glad the plan's on the shelf. We weren't scrambling to do work. We had something sitting there that we could act on. And just under a year later, $750,000 is coming for our Rambling River Center to make much needed enhancements and improvements. Um, we also, again, the addition of our new city, assistant city administrator, Julie Flatten, and we also restructured our human resources and payroll departments. Here's a few pictures from the day that we had our facility tour. Um, we were welcomed by U.S. Senator Tina Smith, U.S. Representative Angie Craig, uh, the Rambling River Center Advisory Board, members of the Park and Rec Commission, the City Council, um, senior leadership with the city, uh, many of the, the center's members were there. It was just, it was a great event to be a part of. It was one of those times that you said, finally us. Like it finally happened to us and it was a big one. Let's hope this video plays now. There we go. The Rambling River Center is a center for ages 50 plus that includes a number of programs and activities. So this building is the former city hall building and police station. When it became the Rambling River Center in 2009, um, a number of improvements were made to the building to make it more of a senior center space, but there are still improvements that need to be made. So we're looking to hire an architect to help us with a facility master plan and have meetings with the members, the Rambling River Center Advisory Board, and see what, they're, what they think this space should look like and what's important to them. In the spring of 22, we put in an application for federal funding Congresswoman Angie Craig, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith supported our application. In January of 2023, we learned that we received $750,000 in federal funding to make improvements at the Rambling River Center. Recently, Congresswoman Craig and Senator Smith uh, visited the Rambling River Center. We had a number of, of members here in attendance along with other city staff. They were able to say a few words uh, we got to show off the space and tour the building. I am just thrilled uh, to be here in Farmington and um, and you have a wonderful community here in police department and I just want you to know how grateful I am for the opportunity to fight to get your taxpayer dollars home because it's going to make a real difference right here in Farmington. Now I used to work in local government and I um, believe that the best ideas are always gonna come from people who are closest to the ground, closest to the work. And this project is just a perfect example of that. So it was so fun to be able to um, support it and advocate for it in Washington through that big complicated appropriations process. And it is really terrific to be able to come here today and see what it might mean, what it will mean for, um, for everybody here. Both the advisory board and the members here have mentioned that they would like a more welcoming and open feeling when they enter the building, not only to members, but also having inviting spaces for people to rent. 
on evenings and weekends. So they're very hopeful. Um, they're very excited to visit with all the people and find out what their ideas are and go from the ground up. We appreciate the funding we did receive. However, we also understand there's going to be future fundraising needed to complete potentially all the building improvements. We'd like to thank our representatives for making this happen. Continuing with infrastructure support, within Park and Recreation, we added two full-time park maintenance workers. We also had the replacement of several aged, inefficient, and unsafe maintenance equipment and vehicles. We completed the Mystic Meadows Trail Reclamation Project. We started treatment on Emerald Ash Borer within our city parks and our city boulevards. In the police department, we implemented a vehicle fleet leasing plan, which is projected to save over $200,000 over the next five years. We also successfully recruited two experienced officers to replace two unexpected departures. Then Public Works, we completed the stormwater pond restoration in Deer Meadows and Fair Hill. The ongoing street improvement project of Division and Spruce Street which just, I believe yesterday, started up again. Mother Nature won last year. We're gonna get that project done before due days this year. Um, I'm gonna go through the, the pictures of all of these here real quick, but the parking lots at the uh, Ramming, at Ramming River Park, Feely Fields, Fire Station Number One, and Schmitz Mackey Arena. Uh, we renewed the city's pavement management program. Now this is, this is something that next year is gonna be more talked about. This year, we will start a two-year process of going through and assessing all of the pavement throughout the community. Um, we know it's not just springtime that we see quality of roads is not where we want it. Uh, the reality is it all takes funding, and we have a lot of roads. We have a lot of roads that need restoration and or replacement. But in order to effectively use the taxpayer dollars, we have to have a full assessment because what we may look at and say this is a priority may not be from an engineering standpoint. So effective planning, financial backing, ensuring that we can complete these projects in a prioritized methodology is going to be most effective. Uh, we also initiate a consultant pool for professional services. Rather than just opening up a bid to anyone who may throw a dollar figure proposal at it, we compiled a consultant pool. This is a group of well-tenured, well-qualified, similar size, scale, and project to things that we're looking at within the city of Farmington so that we have a good solid base and not just opening bids to hope we get something that's competitive. Again, increasing our quality of service. We also ordered a replacement front end loader and as much of our community knows and appreciates, we partnered with MnDOT for the Highway 3 and 66 roundabout. This is a big deal. This was, a, this was so important for our community. We saw this coming down the capital improvement plan schedule. We knew it was gonna happen. It wasn't soon enough, um, but this is a huge safety enhancement, um, not only for now the city of Empire, um, but for Dakota County and for the city of Farmington, this was a major improvement and it got turned around pretty quick. Talked earlier about some of the infrastructure upgrades Feely Fields, so this parking lot is to the west of the softball fields, just south of the Dakota Electric substation. Uh, this would be the southeast corner of 50 and Denmark. If anyone's played ball, gone and watched their kids there in the last three decades, they knew that this lot was undersized. <laughs> and the, and, and our, our park workers appreciate a clean mowing line too, right? So not having the ruts and stuff in the mud. Um, Fire Station 1, uh, we had the asphalt replacement, a um, little bit of an extension to the what would be the, the rear side of the fire department, but also the, the uh, west side directionally. Um, but more importantly, this allowed for continuity of the lot. And the one thing that, that I've noticed most over the last, we'll say, year is the amount of training that can be done in that area. So the, the addition of the live burn trailer, um, their, their ability to assemble in an area that infrastructure isn't an obstacle to effective training. Um, 
So to me, that was a, a more direct benefit to just, you know, other than just putting down asphalt. Schmitz Mackey Arena, common theme, insufficient parking, parking in grass, um, snow removal, all of the problems, uh, lighting upgrades. This is a huge project and a, a significant impact for those that use the arena. Um, this spring, again, staying on, on safety, one of the most important things you'll see is the, the lane that is at the main doors for the arena. Um, I should have actually thrown the mock-up on here, but you'll see it's, it's more of a bus receiving lane. So it's finding ways to get our kiddos off of Spruce Street and into the lot, keep them safe, um, especially at night, early practices, you know, late evening practices. Um, but this, this was a, a good revisioning of just what Spruce looked like in proximity to the arena. Um, plethora of parking spaces added to the east side. As we go into information technology, um, there's a major project that's currently underway within our community. Our partnership with Hiawatha Broadband. So this just goes to show what networking can do. We talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, earlier this year during our goal planning. We went to the annual conference, the League of Minnesota Cities annual conference in Duluth last year. And a 30 minute seminar on broadband and fiber turned into a networking opportunity with a partner that that was late June of 2022. And here we sit the end of April of 23 and we have conduit being put in the ground. It happened that quick. I'm gonna hit on that a little bit later uh, towards the end of this, but networking, telling our story, getting out and building on what currently exists in Farmington literally opens the doors. And this fiber project is proof of that. Hiawatha Broadband, over the next approximately 24 months, initially they said 36 to 48, but their timeline that we've been given now is 24 months, they're going to build out fiber from border to border. Community-wide build out, fiber access to the home. This is gonna provide higher speed network, redundancy of an overall system, economic development opportunities. Fiber and economic development are as synonymous as cars and roads. There isn't a business that doesn't need technology today. And the ability to offer high speed internet access to all users of any need, any demand, with very close proximity is a game changer. Do I believe we could be the Silicon Valley of Minnesota by simply building out our community? Prove me wrong. I think we can. I think this single-handedly changes the score for our community. It's competition for our residents. Competition is good. Not because of price, but because competition raises the expectation of service. When you have more competition, you are forced to be better at what you do, not just provide a service for a cheaper price. And most importantly, it helps address the underserved and unserved areas of our community. The one thing we learned about COVID, the most important thing we learned about COVID was our reliability on access to the internet. And you or I might say it's only 25 bucks a month, it's only 50 bucks a month. That's a huge price point for some people. Having accessibility to, to the internet not only makes sure that our kiddos can stay active in school, they can participate in a timely manner, um, but it ensures that ultimately no child is being left in a situation where they don't have accessibility. Hiawatha Broadband um, has a construction update page that through this QR code will dump you into their updates. They're very active thus far in providing updates on um, their staging plan, timing. You'll see specifically in our community right now, if you look out on Denmark in front of Bachman, you've seen a lot of the fiber, when I, or a lot of the conduit. When I say the conduit, we're talking about the big orange rolls of plastic tube, right? The conduit goes in the ground and the fiber, fiber gets laid inside of that. You're gonna see survey markings, you're gonna see utilities and locating markers all over for the next two years. Um, the line comes in uh, just south of Bachman on Denmark, so it's gonna start there, work towards Bachman, the work art towards the industrial park. Um, getting conduit in the ground in new developments is going to be the quickest and most effective from a price point standpoint because the dirt's already open, right? So 
if they are over here dropping conduit, rest assured they're, they're building through everywhere, even the industrial park, um, but they have a strategic plan and I believe that there's a competitive edge to that as to why we won't always know um, what their phasing is. Here's a big deal, really big deal. We talked about underserved and unserved areas. Uh, in partnership with HBC, uh, we will complete the build out to 20 of our parks and save over $750,000 in future expense to our taxpayers. Our park system is critical, not only to the quality of life for many of our residents, uh, but it also enhances the park experience. It will allow us to offer free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi in those underserved and unserved areas. Things like geocaching, scavenger hunts, augmented and virtual reality, geospatial visualization, interactive mapping, targeted messaging, real-time feedback, and additional public safety. So think of all of the ways that you can utilize technology in your park system, waypoint mapping, historical information, simply through waypoint marking. Having Wi-Fi in our parks not only makes it to where if you're working from home, you can go sit in the park for the day, maybe you don't have the most reliable service, I won't name the provider. Um, we've all been there though, right? Um, is it gonna be the fastest in the parks? No. Is it gonna be safe and secure? Absolutely. Is it going to be free and available to all? Absolutely. And we'll start with 20 of our parks. Our fourth pillar, the three bullet points within our employee engagement culture and wellness are to ensure that all of our employees feel empowered, they feel valued, and they feel appreciated. We wanna promote employee collaboration and create a respectful and trusting work environment. Just this past year, we held a very widely attended employee appreciation event. Um, we've planned an employee culture survey because culture means something different to each one of us. Each one of our teammates, it means something different. Again, we're gonna ask them, we're going to listen and figure out how we can be the most effective employer for them. Wellness, reestablish our safety and wellness committee. Now, I could spend the next hour talking about employee engagement and the importance of your team. And it really, is this, it really is this simple. There are very few businesses or organizations that it can exist without people. Without your people, you can't do any of the work. You can have great plans, great ideas, concepts, but somebody has to do the work. Every survey I've ever read, every study I've ever read, it all goes back to employee recognition and satisfaction of job well done. I've never met someone that's been overpaid to do a job they hated. I've never met someone who worked at a job longer because the pay was so good or the benefits package was so great. But I can show you the plethora of people that say, I love my employer. They respect my time. They, they give me balance, can, you know, secondary education, whatever it may be, but they're recognized for who they are as individuals, not just the contribution to that organization. Our team is our most important asset within the city of Farmington. We cannot deliver core services without them. We need to appreciate them, we need to put them, I'm not gonna say pedestals, but we need to elevate them to a level that they understand that we do the work through you. You know what the qualifications are to be an elected official? 18, resident of your district for 30 days, in most cases not a convicted felon, right? We don't have qualifications to be here. But when we get in this position, sometimes we think we're the smart people and we have all the answers. The truth is, we've exhausted the process to make sure that we hire the right people. They're well qualified, tenured, experienced, well versed, they're good culture fits. When you hire them and you put them in a position and execute on work, get out of their way. Get out of their way. They're the smart people in the room, they know how to do the job, we're there to set the guardrails and make sure that we're all working towards a common vision but people are what make the difference. Now, again, I could talk for an hour, but I gave you four minutes. We asked a few of our employees, again, why Farmington? And this is what they had to say. Why Farmington? 
My answer is why not Farmington? As a new member of Team Farmington, I often have people ask me why Farmington? For me, it's a feeling. It feels right that I am here at this point in time as part of this exact team. It is Farmington's time and I feel honored to get to work with a supportive city council who is asking us to help define the Farmington of the future and then boldly pursue that vision. I feel privileged to be part of a talented leadership team, a group of people who want to be here, working in concert to bring ideas forward and implement the goals of the city council and the community. And I feel lucky, lucky that I get to work with amazing people every day doing the things that I love. That is my why. Community, unity, and wellness. Community is the most important thing that I take pride in. I serve this community with a smile on my face, knowing that I'm making a difference every day, no matter what I'm doing in the capacity that I'm doing it in. That's my why. The city of Farmington has always been flexible and understanding when it comes to having a good work-life balance. And as a city mechanic, the work I perform is exciting and rewarding as others are relying on me so they can be successful in their own jobs. It's good to know that I'm part of a team that is always willing to offer help no matter what the issue. My coworkers are awesome, my work is valued, and the city gives me an opportunity to be a helpful contributor to our community. I look forward to the future and the opportunity to grow within the city. That's my why. I chose the city of Farmington because of the potential it has. As I grow in my career, I'm looking forward to seeing how the city grows with me. I'm looking forward to bringing in new ideas to continually improve parks and trails around Farmington. That's my why. Why Farmington? Well, my story starts back in 1999 when I relocated to Minnesota from southeastern Wisconsin to be with my now wife. I had offers from both Farmington and Apple Valley, and I chose Farmington. Honestly, I only expected to stay a year or two, but fast forward almost 24 years later, and I am still here, and I'm planning on staying until I retire. What kept me here? This place is like a family. I know it sounds cliche, but it's true. Like every family, Farmington has had its ups and downs and bumps in the road. We've had that crazy uncle or aunt, squabbles between siblings, but at the end of the day, we are all still family and we take care of each other. And our family has strengthened over these last few years, and we are the strongest that we've ever been. That's my why. The reasons I chose to work for the city of Farmington are the very same reasons as to why I will continue to work for the city. I've been in this area since 2007, and I've built some great relationships with members of this community. These relationships convinced me that I wanted to work for the city of Farmington. That came true nearly two years ago when I was hired. What I found was that I inherited an incredible team within the liquor operations. That team, along with some new additions, has helped us create a culture of positivity and growth. We are the very definition of a team. Now that I've been working in the city for a few years, I've had the opportunity to build relationships with many of the employees. The one consistent thing that can be said about all of them is that they genuinely enjoy their jobs. Lastly, and most importantly, I think we have an outstanding leadership team within the city of Farmington. While there have been some changes, I can say with 100% confidence that we are incredibly blessed to have such an intelligent and dynamic group of people. This is just a quick snapshot, but these are some of the examples of why working for the city of Farmington truly brings me joy and why I love my job. That's my why. So one of the things that I have the, the privilege of doing is serving on the due days committee. And this year, we are going through and we're looking at our button submissions. And at first glance, everyone looks at the pictures and they're, they're cool, they're fun, they're all a little bit different. Um, but there was one that really stood out to me because of the message that was accompanied with the, the art submission. And so this morning, I've invited Luke to come in and read his little paragraph um, because I think it, for me, it really hit home about what we're doing in the community and how the work that we're doing is seen through the eyes of even our young adults. So Luke. Uh, 
so first off, I would like to thank Mayor Hoyt and Councilwoman Burnouts for contacting me during this week and inviting me to be here today and getting me out of science class this morning. <laughs> no, you heard me say the superintendent's there, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I tried to encap encapsulate some of the things that make Farmington great. The building on the left is City Hall at Dakota Village. It represents our history and how far we've come. The building on the right is our current City Hall and how it will keep getting better in the future. The parade is my favorite part of the due days, and I think everyone enjoys <coughs> that. Uh, the fields are our namesake, and I think its exclusion would be disappointing. Does that not sum it up, right? Um, here's some pictures across the community through the last year of various events. Um, I wanted, I really wanted to have Luke come here because again, like when I, when I saw that it was, it just kind of hits you, you know, you, you get it. Community is buildings and it's opportunity and it's, it's so much, there's so many things that go into it, but it's people. People are the constant, right? And I continue to say, and you hear from this council, you hear from our team, you hear from our business owners that, this community has something different. It is our defining trait. It's our ability to reach out, and as Pam said earlier, um, have conversation over ice cream cones, right? Handshakes. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't exist in other communities. What I'm saying is that we do it best. This community absolutely does it best. Um, you know, when we look back over the last year, uh, and more importantly, as we continue to look ahead, I believe that the following statement is true. We all believe that Farmington is a great community. It's full of amazing people, and we all want Farmington to thrive. Now, how we get there and what that looks like is gonna differ from one person to the next. But we do all agree that we desire to live in a community that is both prosperous and safe. You know, it wasn't all that long ago that our community and I fret to use the word stagnant, but it was just a little stagnant. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of population growth. We had gone through that real big boom. Um, housing was happening, but it wasn't really moving at a pace that was similar with our, our neighboring communities. Um, whether it was downtown or in, or in other areas of, of commercial districts, you saw vacant storefronts. There wasn't a ton of them, but they existed. That's not the same today. And that's a culmination of the work of not only the relationships with those in the room, but the work of our residents, of all of our business owners. We're all changing the score. But much like if you've lived here, if you moved to this community after 2010, you always know 195th to be a road that goes between Flagstaff and Highway 3. And it wasn't always that way. You always or you only recognize that, the, that City Hall exists here. You never saw it where it was in the Randling River Center. You only know if the police department and fire station two to exist within the municipal center. That's a very short period of time. That's 13 years. If you've lived here less than that, you just believe that it, that's the way it's always been. And that's the challenge as we move forward, is it's balancing the needs of residents who have a picture of a short period of time over the, what we, some of us that have been in the community for, Dave, I won't age you, but much longer. Uh, I get my shots too. We both see the same thing. We both see the potential of the community of Farmington, but we see it through a different lens. We see it at different stages. And sometimes that creates arguments or debates about what is, what should be, or what could be. But the common thread, and you can extrapolate this all the way across the nation, is that we all agree that we're trying to be better. How we do that is going to differ, and that's okay. Change is uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable because as Luke said, farm, it's in our name. You can't be Farmington and not have some level of agriculture, right? But if you look at our 2040 comp plan, 
and it's 2023. Even the forecasted projections by 2040 say that 28% of the community is still ag. No one is looking at taking fields and turning them into buildings, but we are growing. We do have needs within our community. We have to address these needs and some of that is going to be some change. It's going to be new development in areas where we used to see open fields. It's just part of the process. There are certain things that we can influence and affect and there's other things that we can't. Um, the city of Farmington doesn't own a lot of land, perspective land for development. Uh, it isn't a game of Sim City. There's not a, I wish we could have this here. Um, yeah, we don't have a grocery store. Does anybody know why? Because the people that know the industry best haven't written the check. It really is that simple. It isn't for a lack of populace, because we have the populace. It isn't for a lack of land availability. We have it, some of them have owned it. There is something in their, their decision-making process that says the time isn't right. We haven't been approached for TIF districts, for establishment of additional incentives. That conversation has not come to fruition yet. And it's difficult because we have a community that has 11,000 qualified employees in it. This is according to deed, over 11,000 workers. 10,200 leave our community every day to their jobs. According to county statistics, 64% of those residents commute on average 26 miles to work. By definition, we are a bedroom community. That doesn't mean we're all houses. It does mean that we do have some mixed re retail and we have commercial opportunities, but there is data that supports why certain things haven't happened. Are we okay to accept that? No, we don't have to like it, but is that the reality? Yes, it is. Um, there was some contention in our community amongst the grocery store and why it became an academy. Frankly, they wrote a check. Here was a property that was zoned for a certain type of use that sat vacant for two years. We had prospective businesses. I won't name them but or name their industry, but we had other people looking at that, that property. Um, they consulted with staff and asked different uses, what was conditional, what was not. But at the end of the day, it was a transaction. It comes down to the person that owned the building and the person that wanted to use the building or buy it didn't have an agreement on price. Unless any of you in the room want to write a check, we weren't going to influence that. Like there's there no way to fix that. But it wasn't that it wasn't happening. Now, I get it, it sucks not having a grocery store. It does suck. But we, we are part of our own problem, right? We, many of us, leave the community for work. We leave the community to do other things. Farmington has unfortunately kind of fallen into this slot of other communities for other reasons have built at different paces and, and offered different things. It doesn't mean that we can't have or shouldn't have or don't deserve, it just means that it hasn't happened yet. And it is happening. We're seeing that through the expansion of our businesses. Great sign, they're growing, they need more space, they're hiring more employees. All great signs and indicative of a, of a healthy local economy. We're engaging in conversations with not only our utility providers, our local educators and institutions. We're engaging with departments like the Trade Office, uh, DEED, Minnesota Housing Authority, we're, we're seeking information to figure out what those constraints are and what we can locally do to fix it. And not everything is a policy decision. We have fiber in our community because of a league conference and a casual conversation, and you have a multi-million dollar investment in your community. So I'm gonna leave you with this. And I apologize for reading this, but I tend to go off script, and when I do, it's usually not favorable because I get a little colorful, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stick to this as much as I can. We've turned the page in Farmington, and we are no longer talking about why things haven't happened, why we don't have this or we don't have that. Instead, we're working together, we're looking forward, and we're demanding more of ourselves. We, 
the entire community are writing our story right now. We have the power in our words and our actions to write the best or the worst outcome. We will continue to encourage everyone's engagement. If you don't like what's happening in your community, show up, be a constructive voice, and not a destructive voice. We, and I stress the we, are all contributors. We all have a responsibility in what the world sees and knows of Farmington. Help us continue to project Farmington as the amazing community that we are. Thank you. Thank you.